Good morning, fifth grade, and happy Friday. Um, we are going to continue with chapter three again today, and we're going to move on to lesson four. So we're going to talk about the middle colonies, and our essential question for this lesson is going to be... Oh, I messed that up. Let me get that really quickly. Hold on. All right, sorry about that. So our essential question for lesson four is what shaped life in the middle colonies. So what types of things happened that helped to shape how the life turned out in the middle colonies? So we're going to look at a region of diversity. The English middle colonies, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, were quite diverse or varied. These colonies were home to people of many different ethnic, background, ethnic backgrounds and religions. They became known for tolerance of these differences. They also became known as centers of commerce. Their central location and fine ports made them ideal for trading and distributing goods both north and south. Outside the port cities, fertile soil and mild climate encouraged farming of wheat, corn, and other grains. Farming was so successful that growers were usually able to produce a surplus or more than they needed. They could sell the surplus to other colonies. For this reason, the middle colonies were sometimes called the breadbasket of colonial America. A crossroads of ideas, as well as trade, these successful colonies helped establish important American principles, such as trial by jury and freedom of the press. They were also home to some of the most influential colonial figures. Among them was art author, inventor, and thinker, Benjamin Franklin. We read about, I believe it was in chapter two, or lesson two, sorry. Okay, so let's start off by taking a look at our map. Um, and the orange here is where the middle colonies are at. So we said, like, um, by New Jersey and Pennsylvania and parts of New York um, and Delaware. So that is where the area we're talking about is right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at our timeline for this lesson. So we have in 1624, we have Dutch traders um, found New Netherland. In 1638, we have Swedish and other traders found New Sweden. In 1664, we have English take New Netherland from the Dutch, renaming it New York. In 1682, William Penn arrives in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have 1732, Benjamin Franklin begins publishing Poor Richard's Almanac. In 1735, we have John Peter Zenger is found not guilty of libel. And in 1738, we have the first Great Awakening continues. All right. Let's go ahead and start with New York and New Jersey. England and the Netherlands were at war in Europe for much of the late 1600s. In 1664, English King Charles II decided to try to gain control of New Netherland to expand its colonies in North America. He put his brother, Duke of York, in charge of seizing the Dutch colony and putting it under English rule. The Duke of York sent a fleet of English warships to New Netherland. English troops reached the colony in August of 1664. The English commander, Colonel Richard, Richard Nichols, demanded that the Dutch leaders in New Netherland surrender the colony immediately. Peter Stuyvesant, the Dutch governor, wanted to fight the English. The Dutch colonists refused. They saw no chance of victory against a powerful English navy. They thought it best to surrender on reasonable terms. Nichols became the governor of England's new colony. England changed the name of New Netherland to New York in honor of the Duke of York. New Amsterdam became New York City. The Duke of York soon granted some of the colony's land to two friends. The friends, Lord John Berkeley and Sir George Carteret, received the land west of the Hudson River. Their holdings became New Jersey, named for an island between England and France that Cotteret had previously governed. 
So if you look at the picture down here, this looks like Colonial, or Colonial New York City was a bustling port and center for trade. We talk about a port, port, that's a place that ships can come in and land at the land and then they can trade and they can take their, um, their goods elsewhere to either their families or their other colonies or to buy and sell again. Dutch governor Peter Stuyvesant in the yellow sash surrenders New Netherland to the English. So that's what this picture is depicting here. Under English rule, the colonists in what had been New Netherland were allowed to live much as before. People continued to speak Dutch, particularly north of New York City. They could continue worshiping in their own churches. Most of those who held land were allowed to keep it. The practice of granting farmland to settlers continued. The English also agreed not to place troops in people's houses without paying for them. People had come to the colony from all over Europe because the colony was, for the most part, tolerant of religious and ethnic differences. Women, too, had more rights here than elsewhere. They could own property, keep shops, and engage in the fur trade. The Dutch had also been active in the slave trade and brought enslaved Africans to the colony to build the settlement or to help farm the land. Though enslaved people had few rights under the Dutch, they did have a path um, through which many could become free. Those working directly for the Dutch West India Company could gain what is called half freedom, supplying slave labor only at certain times of the year. One way in which the English differed from the Dutch was in their treatment of enslaved peoples. This was partly because English authorities feared rebellion from the growing number of enslaved people. They passed a law preventing enslaved people from gathering in groups of more than two. They also made it more difficult for enslaved people to win freedom and much easier to force freed Africans back into slavery. English authorities also feared criticism, which they said might lead to unrest. In 1733, a colonist named John Peter Zanger printed newspaper articles that strongly criticized the governor of New York. Arrested and put on trial, Zanger was defended by a well-known lawyer named Andrew Hamilton. Hamilton insisted on trial by jury, which is a group of peers who decide if someone is innocent or guilty. He then argued that newspapers must have the freedom to print material critical of the government. The judge disagreed, but the jury did not, and Zenger was found not guilty. The trial helped establish two important American principles, the right to a trial by jury and freedom of the press. So we have um, in their words by Andrew Hamilton, it says, the question before the court and you, gentlemen of the jury, is not of a small or private concern. It is not the cause of one poor printer, nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No, it is the cause of liberty. Let's go and continue on with Pennsylvania and Delaware. So William Penn came from a wealthy English family. His father had even lent the King of England a large sum of money. In 1681, the king repaid the debt by granting land in North America to Penn. The land was called Pennsylvania in his father's honor. Some years before, pull this up a little bit. Some years before, Penn had joined the Society of Friends, or Quakers. Some of the members of this Christian group had been jailed and even killed for their beliefs. They believed that each person could have a direct relationship with God. They also thought that all people should be treated fairly. They believed women were equal to men in God's eyes and allowed them to take on roles much larger than those in other religions. Quakers were against war and refused to join the military. In time, they would become strong opponents of slavery. Penn himself had been jailed more than once for his beliefs. He wanted a place where Quakers and others could worship without fear. 
He called his colony a holy experiment to prove that people of many faiths and backgrounds could live together peacefully. Penn explained his plans in his public frame of government and made them part of the Charter of Privileges under which Pennsylvania Colony was governed. In addition to freedom of religion and trial by jury, the Charter set up an elected assembly that could propose and pass laws. However, not all colonists had the right to vote. In addition, a strict moral code limited some personal activities. For example, the performance of plays was banned. And so this is a, a picture of William Penn. When the king gave Penn the land for his colony, a native people called the Lenape, Lenape were living on it. Penn insisted on paying the Lenape for the land. He believed that the Native Americans should be treated justly. His sons, however, did not share those views. After he died in 1737, they used a false document to claim that the colony was entitled to a walking purchase of more Lenape land, the distance a man could walk in one and a half days. Then, they then hired the fastest runners in the colony to cover twice as much land as Lenape had thought they would. When Penn founded Pennsylvania, he planned it its main town or capital city. He called it Philadelphia, Greek for the city of brotherly love. He located it where the, where the um, Schuylkill River and the Delaware River met. This seemed like a good spot for a trading port, since ships could sail down the Delaware into the Atlantic Ocean or northwest on the Schuylkill to to the interior part of the colony. Penn had lived through some terrible disasters in London, and so he wanted a city where disease and fire could not spread so easily. He created a grid of wide tree-lined streets with many small parks and gardens. On them, he planned brick and stone buildings that would not burn. People from all over Europe came to Philadelphia. Many came because they could earn a living much more easily than in their native lands. They also appreciated the rights that they could enjoy there. As trade grew, the city prospered. People who specialized in different goods and crafts, butchers, bakers, silversmiths, cabinet makers, and blacksmiths opened busy shops. So this is a picture here of a man dressed in a colonial era blacksmith. Outside Philadelphia, many immigrants came to farm the land. Among them were German settlers who practiced the Mennonite religion. Some belonged to a strict group of Mennonites called the Amish. These people dressed plainly and lived very simple lives. Their descendants are sometimes called the Pennsylvania Dutch, but that does not mean they are from the Netherlands. It refers to their German background and the language they spoke. Deutsch is the German word for German. South of Philadelphia, along the Atlantic coast, was the area known as Delaware. Swedish traders had come there in 1638 and claimed it as part of their colony of New Sweden. They built a settlement called Fort Christina near what is now the city of Wilmington, Delaware. Insisting that the Swedes took Do Dutch lands, Peter Stuyvesant had captured New Sweden in 1654 and made it part of New Netherland. Ten years later, it became an English possession along with the rest of New Netherland. When the English king granted Pennsylvania to William Penn, Penn was worried because the land had no Atlantic coastline. Ships sailing from the port of Philadelphia had to go down the Delaware River to reach the ocean, and the river sometimes froze in winter. Penn asked the Duke of York to sell him the area we now call Delaware, which did have an Atlantic coastline. The Duke agreed. However, the Swedish, Dutch, and Finnish colonists who already lived in the area did not like the idea of being controlled by Pennsylvania. They wanted to make laws for themselves. So in 1702, Penn allowed Delaware to create its own lawmaking assembly. 
have life in the Middle Colonies. The English claimed the Middle Colonies, but the people who settled there came from many places besides England. The diversity of the backgrounds and religions helped make the Middle Colonies unique. Only a few colonists were wealthy landowners and traders. Many were shopkeepers, craft workers, and small farmers. They worked hard, but there were great opportunities. Farming was difficult with land to clear and weather to worry about. Yet, even small farmers could prosper in the Middle Colonies. Many endured difficulties hoping for a brighter future. In the cities, young boys often signed up as apprentices or trainees learning a craft. They had to promise to work for several years with the master training them. To get to America, some people signed indentured agreements. They promised to work as servants for a certain number of years in exchange for having the cost of their trip to America paid. At the end of that period, they usually got a piece of land, a suit of clothes, or a set of tools and their freedom. Enslaved Africans found it harder and harder to become free. However, the movement to end slavery was growing. In addition to economic advantages, many people came to the colonies for religious reasons. Some, like the Quakers, Jews, and Mennonites, came to the colonies to practice their religion more freely. Others were attracted to new religious movements. In 1739, George Whitefield, an English preacher, returned to the colonies to lead a Protestant movement known as the First Great Awakening because it awakened strong religious feelings. Traveling through the colonies, Whitefield preached to huge crowds of people for, from many different backgrounds. He called for better treatment of enslaved Africans, yet he was also in favor of slavery. So this is George Whitefield's dramatic sermons that drew large crowds. It's a, a depiction of that. Preachers were not the only public speakers that colonists went to hear. Political speeches were, were also well attended. And by the 1700s, printers were distributing newspapers that often contained political news and criticism. The New York Gazette, New York's first newspaper, began publication in 1725. It was put out by a master printer that William Penn originally brought to Pennsylvania to print religious materials. So these are colonists attending a political discussion. Words were central to the life of Philadelphia's most famous resident, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin opened his Philadelphia print shop in 1728. He married a woman who ran a bookshop. In 1731, he helped found America's first library. A year later, he began, publish he began publishing Poor Richard's Almanac which was a magazine famous for its proverbs or wise sayings, such as, there are no gains without pains, and well done is better than well said. Franklin also wrote many other works, including his autobiography. And another proverb that he um, also wrote was the reading we read back a little bit ago about the whistle. So remember he said, never pay too much for your whistle. Um, so that's another proverb that he would have, um, that Benjamin Franklin wrote. So go and read a, did you know about Ben Franklin? So it says Ben Franklin was also a scientist and an inventor. You may have heard of his experiment with a kite and a lightning storm, which helped us understand how electricity works. Franklin was also the first person to use the term battery, conductor, positive charge, and negative charge. Um, so Benjamin Franklin invented so many different items. It was pretty ridiculous how many things he invented. Um, but another really cool fun fact about Benjamin Franklin is that he is the only person on a piece of money. So he's on the hundred dollar bill that was actually never president. So every other person that's on, um, any of our money, the one, five, 10, 20, 50 are, have all been presidents, but Benjamin Franklin was never president but he's still featured on our money.